Thank you. Um, let me see if I can do a little screen share. So um, I, what I thought I would do today is just sort of talk about uh, some concepts around um, resilience. I think that was generally what we were going to try to talk about. Um, but I really um, would welcome having this be interactive. And so, uh, you know, and you have this experience, we're all doing this like Zoom thing. So then, you know, you unmute yourself and two people talk and say, who cares? So who cares? Just like throw in if you have some uh, comments you want to make or questions you have or anything like that, because it makes it more fun. Um, when I, especially because when I feel like I'm um, delivering the kind of stuff that you came here to learn about. So it's frustrating to me if I go to a presentation or a workshop that's titled one thing and I have some expectations and those expectations are not met. So I really want to meet your expectations and, um, and entertain whatever questions or kick around whatever ideas you have. So interrupt, okay? That's the bottom line. Um, and maybe to begin with, um, uh, just to sort of ask you in, uh, in light of this pandemic and the way that we've all been living these horribly isolated lives, um, uh, how do you think about resilience these days? <laughs> you know, maybe if you could put it in one word, what, what word would you use to kind of describe resilience for yourself? I think for me, um, it's been a, a little bit more difficult than usual. Yeah. So difficulty is a word that you might use to, I see uh, Sarah said patience. Uh, yeah, it's, I'd say just learning how to be patient with myself and understanding that it's difficult to hold yourself to a similar standard than previous times. Right, right. And I should say, you know, beyond the pandemic, I mean, that's just one layer, right? We have a crazy president and chaos, um, right? And violence and forest fires and, 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 and. Anybody want to throw in some other words around resilience? Yeah, Zane. I think for me, um, the word that comes to mind would maybe be perseverance. Huh. This is similar to Alondra, but I was going to say hard, <laughs> definitely harder this time around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just even whatever coping strategies you've had. Boy, I sure agree with that pretty hard. Well, so as you sort of think about that, I'm going to see if I can pull up a screen. This is always a crapshoot. I'll see if I get it right. Oh, look at that. I can actually see it. So exciting. Can you all see that? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, now let me see if I can figure out how to show video panel so I can see you all. Okay, amazing. So um, what I thought I would do is combine some concepts between positive psychology and also um, the work of Brene Brown. So as Zane mentioned in the introduction, um, I got interested in the work of Brene Brown in about 2008 or so, which is not long after actually I got interested in positive psychology. So positive psych, I got interested in somewhere in the mid 2000s, mid, mid, I don't know, 2006-ish, who knows. Um, 
and uh, took a couple of classes myself and then uh, had been teaching a class in the psychology of happiness uh, during the summer. It was a weekend class, which I actually didn't teach this past year for the first time in a decade because I didn't want to put it all online. It felt like it was a very interactive class and it felt like it kind of lost something trying to do it online. But um, so, so this is just a kind of um, piece from that. And then uh, I got interested in Brene's work not too long after that. She uh, created training opportunities for licensed professionals to learn the curricula that she had created that went along with her books and with her research. And um, so I got to participate in a whole bunch of training with her. And in her organization, I'm what's called a certi certified Daring Way facilitator, which is just her way of saying that I, um, you know, have kind of gone through all of her training. So I do a group at the counseling center that's based on, um, based on her research and the group's called Cultivating Courage. Um, so starting with positive psychology, um, you all may know this already because maybe you took a class from Steger uh, that positive psychology has tried to sort of quantify happiness. And, um, and, the, and currently the acronym that we work off of is the acronym PERMA, which stands for these five things. Um, and so when you think about, uh, you know, kind of developing resilience during these very hard times, I guess I go back to looking at these basic elements of happiness, uh, starting with positive emotion, which, you know, it's kind of tough to generate positive emotion some days when you feel like the world's crashing in on you. And um, so what does it take to create, you know, some buoyancy in your life? <clears throat> There's the controversial Lasada ratio that talks about um, having a three to one ratio of positive to negative emotion in order to kind of break even on, on the happiness scale per day. And uh, that ratio has been bandied about as, you know, maybe not quite as um, quantifiable as Barbara Fredrickson and Marcel Lasada would have us think. But nonetheless, it's helpful to think about um, the fact that we, you know, it, it seems real anyway, uh, the fact that we need to have uh, more positive emotion in our lives to kind of outweigh the heaviness of negative emotion, which our brains are designed to register and remember, unfortunately, more readily than positive emotion. Engagement is the next feature and having some flow in your life, engaging in activities such as sports or a hobby or camp, you know, going out in nature or whatever it is that you do that enables you to have a sense of time stopping, of engaging in something that's challenging but not too challenging, um, in which you feel sort of a deep sense of satisfaction. So having engagement in your life. And of course, the, the, uh, the big name associated with engagement is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who has an impossible name to spell, um, who started the ball rolling in that research around uh, you know, coining the term flow and looking at how it's important for us to have some part of our day in which we can just sort of get a break. And I think, I don't know about you, but I do seven to nine hours of Zoom calls per day. And so trying to find some space in which to, um, you know, involve myself in an engaging activity. I'm sitting in my makeshift at home office, which is under normal circumstances, my craft and sewing room. And if I like right over, I can't, no, no, thank you. there's all this like, I um, take my word for it. Like my computer is sharing a desk with my sewing machine. And, you know, there's all kinds of craft stuff going on around me. So I try to work it in, in my, in my day to get a break from doing the, you know, the, the work part of my life. Meaning, of course, Mike Steger, we have him at CSU and he, that's his whole area of research is looking at meaning and how important it is to have a sense of meaning in our lives. 
And I guess for me personally, you know, I was talking a moment ago about gushing about this job that I have and had the privilege to be able to do this work for all these decades. And the reason is that it, it gives me a deep sense of meaning and purpose in my life. It's hard for me to imagine how people go through any sustained, prolonged uh, trauma, uh, stressful situation like we are in right now without having a sense of meaning. Um, there's a spiritual component to that. There is, um, you know, this idea of being inextricably connected to one another uh, by some power that's bigger than us, whatever you call that. Um, Brene says some people call that God and some people call it going fishing. Um, but that we have a sense of something greater than ourselves that we devote a portion of our energy to every day. I just realized I have those flipped around. That's pretty funny. Um, positive relationships. Um, I guess if we had to choose one thing from this pile, which is what Brene is all about, is um, it, that is the essential ingredient and it's positive relationships. The, the, the essential or the fundamental imperative of being a human being is to connect with other humans. It's why we're here, even if we're killing one another. And so, you know, even though we seem to have a lot of societal chaos going on, the truth of the matter is that, you know, we need one another in order to survive. And, um, and so when we look at longitudinal studies on happiness, the thing that stands out over and over is the quality of people's relationships. And it doesn't mean that you have 100 Facebook friends, which is not really about relationship at all. Um, but it means that you have a support network in your life upon whom you can rely. And the last thing being accomplishment, which I always think is kind of a funny thing. Like I think about accomplishment as learning new things, being exposed to learning and curiosity and wonderment. And uh, so I think about it more in terms of learning new things. Other people, I think, think of accomplishment as exactly that. You know, so for instance, we could look at President Trump, who might be very high in his sense of accomplishment. And accomplishment is the most, you know, it's like the most highly valued ingredient for him that he will go after at all cost. It won't matter, you know, it doesn't matter how he gets there. So there is this kind of conversation, right, around whether or not um, going about something in a way that others would see as amoral can actually bring you happiness. Um, but I think about it here, especially in terms of the current circumstances that we're living in, as um, pursuing new ideas, pursuing new learning, um, that that keeps us uh, curious and uh, gives us things to look forward to. So there's Brene in uh, 2010, she did this TED talk called The Power of Vulnerability uh, to an audience of about 500 people in um, Houston, Texas. It was a TEDx talk. And within the first two uh, weeks that it was posted on the TED website, it got over 4 million hits. And of course now all these years later, it's gotten you know tens of millions of hits. And she's gone on to do numerous other um, uh, presentations and you know you can find her all over the internet, including a one hour Netflix special that she did. Um, after she did that TED talk, uh, she did not expect to be um, uh, thrown into the, the limelight. That, that was not what she thought was gonna happen. And so it created this big moment of vulnerability for her, actually. Uh, you know, she had talked in that TED talk about being vulnerable and going through her own little breakdown slash spiritual awakening. And, uh, and so when it was seen by so many people, she um, kind of freaked her out. And so in the, in the midst of her own personal freak out, she came across um, uh, this quote from Theodore Roosevelt that talks about the, well, he described it as the man in the arena. I think of it as the human in the arena um, who uh, puts themselves out there, tries hard, uh, lives in accordance with their values um, and is willing to get up and 
do it all again, keep trying to live a uh, sort of a value driven life. And she said that when she read this quote, it was kind of life changing for her, which is when she wrote another book and uses the metaphor of the arena to talk about places in our lives where we need to show up, be seen and live brave. Um, so the arena can be any number of things. It can be a conversation, it can be a new job, it can be a final exam, it can be a relationship, it can be you name it. Any place in your life where you are called upon to show up, be seen and live brave. And I guess I link all of this to a sense of resilience because when we do that, that is how we develop resilience, right? It's all about, you know, falling down and getting up. When you look at images on the internet, that uh, describe resilience, it's always some, you know, lone little plant growing out of this dry crack in the earth. Um, you know, so I kind of feel like that's in alignment with this metaphor and this quote. Oop. Well, we'll just go there. Um, so there's the arena. <laughs> and I like uh, using pictures of actual arenas Carla and I got to be in the Roman Colosseum, and uh, that's a huge place. And they had like 70,000 people that could show up there. I never knew that, there, that it held so many people. And um, when I think of the arena, I think of these ancient structures where uh, it's filled, the seats are filled with all of these people. And then in the, in the arena is you uh, with no weapons maybe you get a shield, uh, and a tiger. I mean, that's how it went, right? So it's like you and some wild animal that could eat you and likely might. Um, and when I think of it that way, it really drives home uh, the feeling like what vulnerability really feels like. So when you step into the arena, what do you give yourself permission to do? So if I think about today as my arena, I might be giving myself permission to be vulnerable, to tell you stuff you might already know, to risk making mistakes, to say um and like too many times that I'll do before I finish the sentence. Uh, so, you know, what are the kinds of things that I need to give myself permission as I enter a vulnerable space? And Brene is a big proponent of permission slips. She walks around with a stack of sticky notes all the time and is forever just writing something down. And it's helpful before you go into a space where you feel like you're going to be vulnerable, what do you need to give yourself permission to do? And I think just coping with day-to-day -day life requires permission slips these days. I started at the beginning of the pandemic. I didn't carry it through the whole time, but for the first several months, I was doing paper rings every day uh, in my house and I had it strung across my ceiling. And each ring, on each ring, I was giving myself permission. What, what did I need permission for that day to survive this crazy, craziness? Um, so vulnerability, the definition of vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. So a condition of uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. The myths that are associated with vulnerability that I think we have to struggle with during these hard times is that it equals weakness. And the challenge around that is you can, and if you can, unmute yourself and interrupt and shout it out. Uh, but I dare you to come up with a single example of courage that did not require uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. So when we act courageously, when we, you know, when we exercise courage, we are also exercising vulnerability. Um, so it's not weakness. Vulnerability is the opposite of that. It's exercising, you know, if, if we stand in that condition, in that, in that um, arena and lean into our values and attempt to live authentically and do our best, that's exercising courage. The second myth is that you can do without it. <laughs> and I guess I see that all the time in my work as a psychologist that people try really hard to build those walls and they're just not gonna be vulnerable anymore because the last time they tried it didn't work out very well. And the trouble is that 
you know, the walls that we build to guard against the vulnerability we experienced earlier in our lives then become the problem. You know, we kind of develop those defense mechanisms to defend against a problem, and then the mechanisms themselves become the problem. So what Brene says about that is that if you don't do vulnerability, vulnerability does you. The third myth is uh, that it means letting it all hang out. So a lot of people will reveal the most intimate details of their lives on Facebook and think that they are being vulnerable, but really they're just oversharing. So it does not mean oversharing. Uh, being vulnerable is something that we exercise with people who have earned the right to hear our story. And that doesn't mean that it's true in every case because sometimes we're just out there being vulnerable and the audience is whoever the audience is. But um, you know, when we practice intentionally being vulnerable, hopefully we're doing that with people uh, who we trust. Um, there's this idea that I can practice it alone. Like I'll practice being vulnerable in my room by myself and then when I get it down really well, I'll come out and show it to the world, which vulnerability is interactive. So you can't do it alone. And the idea that you first have to have trust, and really this is an issue of kind of a hand in hand. Yeah, you have to have a little bit of trust, but not entirely. So you take a risk and then that either builds trust or erodes it. Um, so the kind of growth of trust and the deepening of vulnerability with other people happen hand in hand. And the last thing is you can engineer it. People are always saying, you know, Instagram is great for this. Um, you know, here's the three steps, or here's the five things, or here's the whiz bang pathway. And uh, it's really not something that you can engineer. Like, I'll learn how to be vulnerable by reading this book. It's really something that we have to practice. <coughs> so she talks about the arena as this place where, you know, there's all these people sitting in the arena, um, and that the arena is full of critics. Lots of times the worst critic is our internal critic, uh, the voices in our own heads that tell us that we're not enough and we shouldn't try. But there's also the cheap seats, which again, in the age of social media, it's not hard to find people who are willing to post anything about anyone um, without having any real idea of what they're saying, right? So the world is full of cheap seats right now. And it's amazing to me you know, if you look at the counseling center and the presenting issues that come through the counseling center, it used to be maybe a decade ago, there'd be this kind of, oh, sort of even Steven presentation of depression and anxiety. They were kind of the major two presentations or family issues or some childhood trauma. But in the last decade, you could look at a graph and see anxiety just going up and up and up and up. And so right now that is far and away, by light years, it is the most common presenting issue at the counseling center. And a lot of it revolves around social anxiety about this fear of being judged, this fear of showing up and what will people think? And I think a whole lot of that has been accelerated by people's attention to social media. There's also the box seats which, uh, you know, that's a very prominent feature of our society right now. The box seats are occupied by the people who built the arena. So people who have an investment in you feeling shitty about your race, age, gender, class, ability. Um, and we could go on and on about all of those classifications. But there are, you know, we live in a white supremacist culture, misogynistic white supremacist culture that, wants nothing more than for certain segments of our population to feel shitty because it serves their purpose. So what comes up when you're in the arena? Feelings of scarcity, shame, comparison, perfectionism are all the things that we kind of rumble with when we're standing in that arena. So vulnerability is the core of shame and fear and our struggles for worthiness, says Brene but it also appears to be the birth, birthplace of all the good stuff. And the trouble with vulnerability is that we don't get to say, I only want the good feelings. You know, joy, belongingness, love, being the best grandmother in the world, you bet, I'll do that. 
I don't want any of the shit though. I don't want any of the hard stuff. And the trouble is that you can't, you cannot do that. You can't live an authentic life without dealing with all of it. You cannot select out only the good stuff. We try that, you know, we, we really try to do that, but it does not work. So what comes up when we're feeling vulnerable? Shame. Here's a definition of shame. Uh, is the intensely painful feeling that comes from the belief that we are deeply flawed and because of that, unworthy of connection and belonging. I feel like this is a really powerful definition. Um, that painful feeling that we just are crap no matter what. Uh, a lot of people come to therapy and, and in our vernacular every day will say, well, I feel so guilty. You don't feel guilty. You feel shame. Guilt is a good emotion. You know, that's an appropriate thing to feel. If you mess up and you feel guilty, that means you're not the president. Um, and, uh, you know, Brene says the only people who don't experience shame are people who lack the capacity for human connection. So people who we might think of as personality disordered or having some neurological issue that prevents them from connecting with other humans. So you don't actually want to be one of them. And so as long as you want to connect with other humans, what's going to happen is that from time to time, you'll feel shame. The good news about shame is that it's the most fundamental human emotion there is. It's been with us since the Pleistocene era. Um, you know, back in the day, if you did something that threatened the survival of the group, they put your ass on the tundra and keep walking. And so we are wired from time immemorial to always be looking over our shoulder to see whether or not we're fitting in, doing the right thing. And of course, now we know how that shows up in the 21st century. Uh, so what we, what we strive to do is to become shame resilient not to become shame resistant, to look, to be able to identify shame when we're feeling it, to name it, to have a sense of how it got there for us, um, and then to put practices in our lives that help us become resilient around shame, which I will explain momentarily. So it feels like the blob. Uh, you know, oftentimes I'll ask people to draw a picture of shame and it always looks like something blobby or isolated or dark or swirly. Um, and so I, I like this from a movie from yesteryear that to me that that's a good depiction of how shame feels. When we feel that, we don't want to feel it. Um, so we do everything we can to not feel it. And what we do are to develop these shields to like, ugh, this feeling is awful. I don't want it. So we build walls. We, we get shields around us to keep us from having to feel that. And in our world, in our humanity, there are three major shields that we work with. Uh, one of them is moving away. So we disappear, we withdraw into our own lives, um, or we move toward, we become people pleasers. So, you know, I don't feel very good about myself, but I really want to fit in. So I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'll smile wherever you need me to smile. Just accept me. So we move toward. Or my favorite, we move against. Um, I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, in the inner city. And I always said in my neighborhood, a baby's first word was A. Eh. So, uh, you know, anger is my favorite shame shield, uh, that we use shame and anger to fight shame. So I also call that the I suck and fuck you approach to life. So I feel crappy about myself, but fuck you. Oh, and this is being recorded. Oh, well, there you go. The grandma who says fuck all the time. Um, so what do we do to mitigate against shame? The two most important seats in the arena are empathy and self-compassion. If you put shame in a Petri dish and douse it with secrecy, silence, and judgment, which is what we do, we love to shame, and douse it with secrecy, silence, and judgment, and you come back the next day, that Petri dish has grown over its edges and is starting to take over your lab, because that is what, those are the conditions that make shame grow. If, however, you douse it with empathy and self-compassion, 
shame cannot survive in that environment. Empathy and self-compassion are hostile to shame. Uh, we all kind of know what empathy is, right? Which is perspective taking. I don't know why I don't have a slide in here that says that, but taking the perspective, someone else's perspective, staying out of judgment, uh, communicating our feelings, communicating your understanding of those feelings, and practicing mindfulness. So, you know, when we're practicing empathy, which I actually think is really, we could get into a psychology story about this. I think it's really exercising compassion. Um, empathy is the raw material, compassion is the vehicle. Uh, and so when we exercise compassion toward another human being, we're not like getting stuck in their feelings with them, uh, but maintaining a sense of mindfulness, a little bit of compassionate distance so that we can be helpful, but not get stuck as well. Um, but in any case, those are the elements of empathy. And then the last slide I have here is exercising self-compassion, which is treating yourself as kindly as you would treat a friend that you care about, recognizing that whatever it is you're going through, someone else has before you, that there is some common humanity in our suffering. And again, practicing mindfulness, kind of noticing, oh, this is what's going on for me. Um, and being able to kind of put our hands over our hearts and saying, you know, they're there, sweetie, it'll be okay. So those are the main shame fighters. Okay, now I'm going to stop this, come back to us. Whew, that was a lot of talking. Uh, and entertain questions or comments or where shall we go from here? Um, yeah. Actually, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I had, I had a question because, um, you know, being a little vulnerable myself, I'm graduating in two weeks. Um, oh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and to be honest, it's been really difficult in the job market to get oh even an interview, to even get a second look. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, self-compassion or, or resilience, especially in the job market right now, being so bad <laughs> without a better word, what do you, do you have any like, advice for that kind of situation? You know, I, when I think about self-compassion and self-compassionate messages, it always, in my brain, it always starts with the phrase, of course. Of course I feel afraid and overwhelmed and scared about my future. Who wouldn't feel this way if they were a graduating senior in 2020 in a pandemic with the world on fire who on earth would not feel scared of course i feel scared and worried it makes total sense and it's okay that i feel this way and i think there are few spaces in life sarah that are more vulnerable than when you are looking for a job. There is such vulnerability in job hunting. So if you are in that arena, in this environment, you are heroic to just be standing there, I wanna say. Um, so to recognize that that's what's going on right now and give yourself permission to be scared as hell. Like, you'd have to be nuts not to be scared, right? Does that make sense to you? It does, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Some people mistake, you know, they think of self-compassion, especially when you're like a perfectionist student, straight A, you know, people think about self-compassion as the same as self-indulgence. It's not that at all. It's just recognizing that, of course, this is a terrible thing. What else? Uh, Zane, you were going to say something. I was just going to say, feel free to ask questions. You know, anyone yeah. jump in now if you'd like to. Please do. Um, I just want to kind of share something about me. Um, so. Honestly, this talk just helped me so much because 
I recently had an unexpected surgery, um, which was like totally out of nowhere. So I was in the hospital for about four weeks. Oh, and, sheesh. Yeah. And like, honestly, like it impacted me so much because like you said, like I'm, I'm a high, very high achiever. Um, so just like school, like just knowing that I was behind so much, like I just felt stressed even in the hospital. I was thinking about it and I was like, I should be focusing on other things right now, but I'm just thinking about school. And like, also like another part was that I, um, like I've been lifting weights for almost three years already. So like all the work that I worked for, I lost it in like two weeks because I couldn't eat for two weeks. And so like, I lost like 30 pounds. <laughs> it was crazy. So I was just having a really hard time. But um, I think after your, your talk, it helped me a lot. And just like being aware of self-compassion and um, again, what you were talking about with resilience as well. So thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. And uh, congratulations for surviving. <laughs> that's that's yeah. pretty amazing. Glad you're still on the planet. Right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But, you know, and I appreciate that you're bringing that up and, and that we're kind of talking about these vulnerable spaces we're in. You know, I always just feel so heartbroken that the world um, doesn't give us public space in which to talk about vulnerability and that we, you know, the arena is so fraught with uh, critics and uh, especially right now. And so, um, you know, I, I think in some ways our public discourse has become more shaming than ever, um, at least louder uh, and more public than ever, maybe not more shaming than ever, but certainly, you know, it's got, it's got quite a megaphone these days. And, uh, and how, how brave it is to be able to say, you know, I've been having a hard time and here's why. <laughs> and I'm human because it's going on for all of us. We've all got that story, you know? I mean, we have variations on it, but we've all got that story. Michelle, what else are you thinking? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit, because you've talked about how, you know, one of the issues is the judgment that, you know, people come into the counseling center. I mean, I hear this all the time. I hear this uh -huh. with my friends. I feel this myself too. Yes. That there's just so much judgment out there. And like you're saying, in a, in a way, in a new way, this public way. Yes. And so we feel like we're in these arenas with just lots of critics. I mean, I'm a teacher of, you know, hundreds of students. So I kind of, this is kind of my life, you know, is every time I go to do a lecture, it feels pretty vulnerable. There's a lot of people looking and listening and critiquing. And so how do you help people you know, deal with that. It's a, it's a reality of our life. Um, right. Can you just say a little bit about like, what, what do you do with people who about are around that judgment issue? Well, I really feel like we have to be um, mindful of how our daily habits and practices may or may not be contributing to that. And so, um, you know, I, I spoke with someone not too long ago who was struggling in very many ways, academically and otherwise. And I said to him, how much time do you spend on, you know, like some form of social media? And, you know, of course, now your phone will tell you, it'll rat you out. And, you know, and he said seven hours a day. Well, I said, you have a full-time job then. You're going to school in addition to having a full-time job and the full-time job is that you're on social media. So if you think about it in terms of is, you know, if you're spending four hours a day, you have a half-time job while you're going to school and maybe you're going to school uh, and working somewhere else. So now, and if you think about it in terms of how you're spending your time and how much energy it takes to be comparing yourself to other people, perhaps that can provide some kind of motivation to to let it go it's very scary it seems very scary for people to turn off social media um but i feel like having social media fasts every now and then can be helpful painful hard anxiety producing and enlightening if you can get 
through that. So I think it starts with some consciousness raising around how much we're feeding the beast, you know? I mean, we've always, like I said, since time immemorial, we've always compared ourselves to other humans, but we didn't have the vehicle to compare ourselves to, you know, literally millions of other humans if we want to. And that has a tremendous impact. Um, so, you know, sort of looking at that, but also having to wrestle with um, perfectionism is huge. And, um, you know, and kind of dealing, dealing with those kinds of perfectionistic messages that you get from one place or another. It's another piece. Um, to add a little bit of a unique perspective to that, I think it's really interesting, especially since campus has moved online and all of our lives and our education are now in a virtual format. Even more so, I work for the university and I work in the biology and chemistry departments um, for the learning assistant positions. So we work with students and I help teach recitations and all that. And more so, since things have moved online, since having that job both face to face and in person now or online now, um, I think it's an interesting perspective to look at that now my job is also virtual. It's also on my phone and it's in group chats and it's on an app on my phone. And so I think it's interesting to look at it from an outside new perspective because this is something that we've never had to deal with before. This is something brand new and we're kind of all guinea pigs <laughs> to the whole situation, which I think is yeah. interesting to see where we'll look back on, on how we Oh, amen. Yes, we are all guinea pigs, and it. I think we're going to be uh, talking about this for many years to come, and the profound um, impact that going virtual has on us as individual organisms and on our culture, and you're absolutely right. And people who are kind of addicted to the internet or whatever, it's harder to get away. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what else are you thinking? Hi. Hi. I really liked your talk about compassion and empathy. But I'm thinking um, where to draw the line when you're vulnerable with someone and they try to shame you for that. Where to draw the line between um, enforcing boundaries uh, to not fall for mm. that and to empower yourself okay i want to teach have you a, compassion for them yeah okay i want to teach you a really a really big concept in five minutes mm -hmm. ready yeah. so brene has this idea that she calls living big living big living big and it starts with a question that you ask yourself do I believe that other people, and by other people, I mean everyone else on the planet Earth, do I believe that other people are doing the best they can? So, <laughs> and for me, Michelle Ferris, the answer is yes. I believe that other people, even people who I really, really, really don't like, maybe especially those people, I believe that other people are doing the best they can. So, Car so I'm gonna pretend that Carla and I are in a relationship and uh, um, every day <laughs> Carla comes home from her very stressful job and she gets really mad at me and uh, kind of smacks me around a little bit. Can you imagine Carla doing anything like that? Never, 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 never. Um, and, uh, and she's really mean to me. And, um, and I say, well, you know, she's trying hard. She's under a lot of stress. I know she can do better. Um, I have a lot, of, you know, she had a tough childhood or whatever and, um, and it's okay. And then she comes home the next day and does it again. And then I say that, right? Um, and so I'm harboring the belief that she can do better. If on the other hand, I say, Carla, God bless her. She's doing the best she can. You know, she's had a lot of struggle in her life and it's been tough. 
And I really accept that this is as good as it gets. This is, she's doing the best she can. So the next question for me is what boundaries do I need to put in place? That's the B. In order to operate from a place of integrity and make the most generous assumption of her that I can. So that might look like, I get that your life is stressful and it's really hard and you've had a lot of tough things happen in your life and it's, you know, it's really difficult for you to manage that stuff. Um, and I have a lot of compassion for that. Uh, and though, it's not okay for me to be treated in this way. So here's my boundary. I'm gonna move over there, <laughs> wherever over there is, um, because that's what I need to do to take care of myself. I wish you the very best. May the force be with you. I care for you a lot, and here's what I'm gonna do to take care of myself. So if I'm in a vulnerable space and I feel like I'm being abused over and over, then I need to ask some questions about what, what are those boundaries that I can put in place to operate from a space of integrity and make a generous assumption of you. So in a nutshell, that's the concept of living big. What do you think, Rosin? Does that make sense? That's really great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's really useful. When I learned that concept from her, I have to say it was kind of life-changing for me because I think a lot of us go through life saying, yeah, they're doing their best. I know they're trying hard and they can do better. Well, you can't believe those two things. If I really accept in my bones that you are doing your best, there is no such thing as better than best. What you see is what you get. And so operating, now, Carla could wake up tomorrow morning, in, the, in my example, she could wake up tomorrow morning and say, Oof, I don't think I'm being my very best self. I need to change up some stuff here. I need to do better. We can always make that choice for ourselves, but it's not really to our advantage if we go around making that choice for other people. The other thing that I would steer you in the direction of is that um, Brene has this great video called The Anatomy of Trust. It's a wonderful video. I suggest you watch it. Thank you. Mm. We have another couple minutes. You know, on Zoom time, we run it right up to the clock. So what, <laughs> what else might be on your mind? Um, okay, I have a question. Let's see hey. if I can phrase it <laughs> correctly. Um, so I'm sure you deal with a lot of um, clients who are like feeling really helpless and might feel that they don't know how to practice these things. Mm -hmm. um, like there's maybe no hope for them, something like that. And I'm curious what your what you tell them and how you kind of go about that and maybe like some tools that you would provide for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the most important thing to take into the arena with you, you know, which we didn't really have time to discuss today, but you know, when you go into the arena and you're practicing vulnerability, it's like you're sort of naked, but you know, is there one thing that you can take? And the one thing is your values. And so I feel like it's important to kind of start with looking at what are our values? Like, what do I stand for? What, what's most important for me? And um, it's important for me to identify my values because then I can look at all these parts of myself and kind of bring them all home together, you know, sort of the integrated Michelle Ferris. Like, what does that look like? And what are those pieces that matter the most to me? Because that's what I build on. That's, that's what makes my life worth living. And so maybe the, the place to start for some people that begins to instill a sense of hope and agency and direction and gets you out of the hole of helplessness is to identify for yourself like who you are and what you stand for. I think in our culture, 
we don't have rituals in our culture very much. We have some, we have some, but we don't have a lot of rituals in our culture that help us identify what those values are. What is this meaning? You know, what is it that gives our lives meaning and purpose? Who am I and what do I stand for? Um, and so that seems to be an important piece. But also, you know, people come, people come to therapy afraid and feeling helpless and hopeless. And so our job as psychologists is to provide that empathy and to teach self-compassion. So, you know, sometimes you begin to build little tiny, little baby steps, but hopefully eventually get there. Thank you. Mm. And I think it may, that's, y'all probably have this figured out, this profession you're going into, it's really hard. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> 11.57. I was born at 11.57 p.m. All right, darlings, I think we might have come to the end, yes? Yeah, if there's no, if there's, yeah, no uh, further questions for Dr. Ferris or further thoughts. You can uh, always track me down on email, you know, michelle.ferris, callistate.edu. You know, just track me down, hunt me down. I'll talk to you about anything any old time. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was mm -hmm. so good. Oh, yes. good. I'm glad. Yeah, Thank you so much for being here and talking for Psychi and PSA. We we really really appreciate that. We're so happy to have. Well, you well, thank you, and I'm I'm so glad that I got to come and be like, oh, look who you are. This is exciting. So, <laughs> thank you so much for making my day. It was of awesome. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.